Last week on our coverage of the missing books from the Bible on the Dark Outpost, we covered the Gospel of Truth. Up until now, all of the missing books that we have covered have been considered the Gnostic Gospels or the Inner Knowings, more like teachings of wisdom from Jesus. Well, today we're going to go into a missing gospel that resembles more of the gospels we're used to from the canonized Bible. But don't, don't get me wrong, this book is considered heretical as well. But before we go any further, you know what to do. Please hit that subscribe button and give us a like. Again, such a special thank you to all of our patrons. If it was not for you guys, we would not be able to continue to go and do what we do on this channel. So much appreciation to you all. If you would like to join our Patreon program, there is a link down in the description box below. Welcome to Esoteric Atlanta. My name is Bryce, and today we're gonna to be covering the Gospel of the Holy Holy 12. Now the Gospel of the Holy Twelve is a very long gospel, therefore we're going to be dividing this gospel up into two different parts. Today of course is part one. Now as always, because of censorship on YouTube, if you want a more in-depth look at these missing gospels, I would suggest going over to the darkoutposttv.com and watching our interviews there. Because David has a private platform, we can go really deep into what these gospels represent versus what I can give you here again, because we all know that censorship is real. For today on part one of our look at this gospel, we are strictly going to go over the history of this gospel. I feel like understanding the history of this gospel, as well as all the other gospels that were banned, will make some people feel a little bit better about the idea of going through something that the Christian church has labeled as heresy. And just a reminder, heresy is basically a word that means something that goes against the traditional narrative. It's not as powerful as a word as you think it is. For example, if you don't aren't going with the mainstream media narrative that we have going on right now, then you would technically be considered a heretic. That means I'm a heretic. You see how that works? So basically, with a lot of these missing books of the Bible, they will, were labeled as heresy by the Council of Nicaea because they went against what the Roman Emperor Constantine was planning to do in order to turn this new faith into a state religion. Through our research, we are also aware that Constantine himself was not a Christian. He was a Canaanite. He practiced a religion called Mithraism. Although the church will tell you he was this holy saint that brought Christianity to the Roman Empire, that is simply not true. That is purely propaganda. You see, propaganda has been around since the beginning of our time. I will link a video down below over Constantine if you're a little bit confused about that. At the Council of Nicaea, when Constantine and all of his bishops were going through all of these journals, these gospels, and deciding which would stay and which wouldn't stay, they were looking for gospels that they could easily alter. Yep, that's right, alter. A lot of the canonized Bible that we have in our, what we know as the Holy Bible, have been changed. And this is not just my opinion. This is this can be found in any research you do on the Council of Nicaea. And I'm going to read you guys something from the Nazarene Way, which is an amazing website that goes through the Gospel of the Holy Twelve. It says, The Legend of the Lost Gospel. For nearly 2,000 years, all we objectively knew of Jesus came to us primarily through the biblical gospels. And yet, for all this time, a great and enduring enigma has loomed over these lofty works. In the fourth century, the ruling authorities of Rome decided which of the countless texts, based on Christ's teaching and circulation at that time, 
would make up the present day Bible and deciding once and for all, in effect, which works were to be judged as authoritative and which were not. This decision unfortunately carried the undeniable taint of political compromise, and the bishops making these decisions were doing so at the direct command of the Roman emperor, and their future financial and social well-being was, and everyone agrees, entirely under his control. It has been whispered ever since the 4th century that much of the true message of Jesus was edited out at that time due to the oppressive and theological obtuse influences of Constantine. The Christian scriptures that failed to be admitted into the Bible were then outlawed, collected, and destroyed. So once again, this was all about control, how to control the masses. We know through the Gnostic Gospels that we've looked at, Jesus came to teach liberation, liberation from the control of illusion or sin. Jesus taught us about an inner world, an inner work that we have to do to connect back to our almighty God. Well, you see, the thing about these controlling Canaanites, these um, deep state, uh, if you will, which Constantine, the emperor, would have been part of the what, what we call the deep state today or the cabal, they can't have humanity free. They need humanity under their control. And by creating a state religion and making them the authorities on Jesus's word, well, then you become enslaved to those authorities. We know that soon after Constantine, the world went into the Dark Ages. This is very strange because right before the Dark Ages, we had like the Library of Alexandria in Athens, so we were flourishing. I do believe the Dark Ages, for some reason, was controlled by the Catholic Church. This meant that people were vulnerable. And when you're vulnerable, you have a lot of fear. When you have a lot of fear, you desperately cling to any, any sound of salvation. And unfortunately, the Catholic Church, as the Canaanites tend to do, manipulated this. At this point, the Pope started telling people that they had to give up their money, their hard-earned money, and give it to the church in order for them to hold a place in the kingdom of heaven. Well, this obviously is not in the Bible at all. So in my opinion, that means that we have to understand the Bible that we have today, the canonized Bible, has been altered. We have to honor that, that there has been changes made, that were, they were made 1,700 years ago. I do believe that the original copies are in the Vatican Library, but we have to be aware of that. We have to understand that. When we look at these lost Gospels, though, we get a better understanding of what Jesus actually taught people. I hope that makes sense. Now, with the Gospel of the Holy Twelve, we do have storytelling again. We do have this timeline of Jesus's life, which is very similar to the Gospels that are in the canonized Bible and not so similar to the Gnostic Gospels that are simply wisdom-based teachings. Many biblical scholars believe that the Gospel of the Holy Twelve, along with the missing Gospel of Q, were the original Gospels. These were the hard copies, the Rosetta Stone that everybody had when they were writing all the different Gospels. It was their reference point. It's how they knew that they were telling the story correct from their teacher. Many scholars believe that the Gospel of the Holy Twelve was somehow written by all 12 disciples or dictated by all 12 disciples. We do have reference to John. When he was imprisoned, he would write different pages every day and pass them out the window to a fellow disciple to save. And we think at that point, John was working on his portion of the Gospel of the Holy Twelve. Now, John did also translate, apparently, allegedly translate some of this Gospel into Latin. The reason why scholars are certain that this was worked on by all the disciples is because there is a massive amount of detail in these passages. You can tell that these stories are not being told secondhand, but they're being told by somebody who was there when certain events happened. From what I've read in the Gospel of the Holy Twelve, there is definitely more detail than there is in the canonized Bible. That goes without argument. Now, scholars do believe that the Gospel of the Holy Twelve was not this Gospel's original name. In fact, they believe this Gospel's original name was the Gospel of the Nazarenes. 
That might sound familiar from the act of Philip. Philip is called a Nazarene by the other people in Athens who were of the Jewish faith, but not of his faith. He, they were pointed out as being Nazarenes. We have to also look at the root of the word religion. I bet you don't know this. In fact, when you Google it, it's not gonna come up on Google because Google censors like crazy, but the original word of religion meant to follow the reign of many legions, the reign of many gods. So you see, being a Nazarene was separate from any of the Canaanite gods or religious practices that were around in the day. That, those were religions. They were following legions of gods, whereas the Nazarenes were following one god. They were not of a religion, but a faith. Well, I believe that the original um, people that started the uh, Christian faith as a state religion at the Council of Nicaea were very well aware of this. And we know that the uh, Church of Rome was a Canaanite church, a religion. And so therefore now Christianity also carries the term of religion. That means to follow many gods, which we know for sure the faith is not that. So we know that Jesus was of Nazareth, Jesus of Nazareth, but we also have to look at the word Nazarite. The Nazarites were a group of people within the Jewish faith that took their vows as mentioned in the Gospel of Numbers. However, by the time that Jesus came around, we saw the growing of a group called the Essenes. The Essenes are from our episode on the Dead Sea Scrolls, which again, I'll link in the description box below. They were the people that lived in Qumran who were the original Christians who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls. We believe that Jesus, as well as his disciples, were possibly Essenes. Well, this history of this gospel proves that that, that is probably correct because a Nazarite and an Essene makes the word Nazarene. The Essenes were a more evolved group of the Nazarites, the Nazarite Essenes. Now the Gospel of the Holy Twelve speaks a lot about animals. It basically tells you, as we've seen in a lot of the Gnostic Gospels, that in order to practice the Christian faith, you have to be a vegetarian. You have to abstain from doing any harm to any of God's living creatures. Now, I am a vegetarian. I've been a vegetarian for a very long time, for most of my life. And as I've said many times before, I'm not here to tell you how to eat. But I do find it very interesting that this is really important because Jesus also freaks out about blood sacrifices in this work. He doesn't want you sacrificing animals. We know that within the blood of any living thing, we have something called adrenaline or adrenalized blood. I can't say the full name because of censorship, but it is something that is considered a drug. We do know with our farming industry today that there is essentially some, some torture that happens to animals before they are slaughtered. And of course their adrenaline is, is rising as well before that happens and so that's in our, in our meat. So it's just something interesting to ponder. And in fact, a lot of scholars believe that this was part of the reason why they just chucked this gospel out of the canonized Bible. It, it's, there's so much about eating meat and being a vegetarian in this gospel that it's, it's would be really hard to alter because it literally is all over the gospel. And of course, these Canaanites, they, they can't have that. They need sacrifices. Remember, one of their gods is Moloch. And Moloch, who is mentioned in the Bible, is, is a god that demands human sacrifice. So they can't have anything in there that's going to dissuade people from participating in this type of ritual. Now this gospel, a lot like the Gospel of Thomas, was mentioned by many of the early church fathers that existed before the Council of Nicaea. I will include a list of these people right here. Because of these people and their authority and their fame for being such big, big pillars of, of strength in the original church, it's another indication to scholars that this gospel was, was really important in the beginning of the fledgling faith of Christianity. In fact, for me, I've seen zero proof of this gospel being heretical and mounds of proof that this gospel is actually 
a legit gospel that should have been in our Bible. Now, like a lot of the other banned books from the Bible, we thought we had lost it completely. Yes, of course, all those books are in the Vatican Library, I am sure, but none of us have access to that, so people just assumed it was gone. Well, in 1870, a complete copy was found in a Tibetan monastery. This copy was written in Aramaic, like a lot of the original Gospels were written in Aramaic. And as it was found, people quickly started to translate it into English for us. People were so excited, they started to print them in newspapers all over the Western world. Well, of course, the church was pissed. They quickly started telling people not to read this, that it was complete heresy, which to that I say, piss off. We can decide for ourselves what is heretical and what is not. That is not the Christian faith. Let me repeat this again. It is not the Christian faith for somebody to tell you what is the word of God and what isn't the word of God. That goes against everything talked about in the Bible. You and you alone are responsible for your discernment over what is the word of God and what isn't because this is a personal relationship that you have with God. No human being, I don't care who it is. I don't care if it's the Pope or if it's your preacher or your uncle or your aunt or your grandma. No human being has a right to interfere with your relationship with God. Take your power back. And people who do try to f interfere with your relationship with God, well, that's abuse. And there is such thing as spiritual manipulation and spiritual abuse. So please do not let anybody bully you when it comes to your own understanding of God. Once they were able to translate this gospel into English, they were quite amused because they found a lot of the things in the King James version of the Bible were identical to what was in the gospel of the Holy 12 or the gospel of the Nazarenes. Well, duh, of course, because the Gospel of the Holy Twelve or the Nazarenes, along with the Gospel of Q, were the original Gospels. Again, they were like the Rosetta Stone. It was it, when, when the students went to go write down their teacher's stories from their times with Jesus, they would refer back to these Gospels to make sure they had gotten information correct. Now, a lot of people in the church were like, oh, see, this Gospel of the Holy Twelve, it's total fraud because it's copied from the King James Bible. Such bullshit. It was not copied from the King James Bible. It, the King James Bible or the Bible it was translated from in Latin was copied from this book because duh, it was the, it was the Rosetta Stone. Now to end this off, I am going to read you the prologue to the Gospel of the Holy Twelve. And then of course, next week we will get into the actual scriptures themselves. Just a quick note though, before I start reading this, um, I am gonna be interviewing David Zublik for my channel. I know I've gotten a lot of sweet messages saying people miss him on YouTube. So I'm gonna interview him on my channel for you guys to hear from him about his journey and what he's gone through being a truther out there. So if you have any questions that you would like for me to ask David, then please email them to esotericatlanta at gmail.com. I'm also going to place a great website that has the Gospel of the Holy Twelve and a lot of information about its history down in the description box below as well for you again to do your own research. I, I always want people to do their own research and decide for themselves what they believe about a particular topic. The prologue to the Gospel of the Holy Twelve goes as follows. Here begins the gospel of the perfect life of Jesus Maria, the Christ, the offspring of David, through Joseph and Mary, after the flesh, and the Son of God, through divine love and wisdom, after the Spirit. From the ages of ages in the eternal thought, and the thought is the word, and the word is the act. And these three are one in the eternal law, thought, word, and act. And the law is with God, and the law proceeds from God. All things were created by law, and without it is not anything created that exists. In the word is life and substance, the fire and the light. The love and the wisdom are one for the salvation of all. And the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness concealeth not. 
The word is the one life-giving fire, which shining into the world becometh the fire and light of every soul that entereth into the world. I am in the world, and the world is in me, and the world knoweth it not. I come to my own house, and my friends receive me not. But as many as receive and obey, to them is given the power to become the sons and daughters of God. Even to them who believe in the holy name, who are born, not of the will of flesh and blood, but of God. And the word is incarnate and dwelleth among us, whose glory we beheld full of grace. Behold the goodness and the truth and the beauty of God. All right, guys, thank you so much for sitting through this. Again, next Wednesday, we'll be doing part two where we go into the full scripture of the gospel of the Holy 12. Thank you again to Josh McKay for doing our music. If you would like to purchase our opening song, there is a link down in the description box below. And thank you to Todd Broderick because without Todd, I would not be able to get this video out to you guys. So thank you so much. And I will talk to you soon. Bye.